So this mini lecture that I didn't have time to do in class is to just tell you a little bit about um, gene therapy history and some of the highlights and you'll see lowlights of gene therapy um, over the past, I guess now it's been 30-ish years. Um, so one of the first successes of gene therapy was um, for this girl, Ashanti De Silva, who is a cute little four-year-old right here. Um, this was 1990. Um, Ashanti was four years old, and she has a disease called ADA skid. So ADA stands for adenosine deaminase. deaminase. ADA. Um, and so she had a mutation in this um, gene, and so she was not producing this enzyme, which is um, important in immune function. So SCID stands for severe combined immune deficiency. So this lack of um, functional copy um, of this enzyme resulted in her having a um, uh, immunocompromised system and um, normally this is a fatal disease um, I believed she was heterozygous so she had some um, ADA uh, enzyme being produced and she was also getting um, ADA replacement therapy so not a gene therapy but giving her um, the protein so September 14th 1990, um, they did an ex vivo gene therapy where they um, took out bone marrow and, and isolated some of her T cells, so cells in the immune system, and used a retrovirus to insert a functional ADA gene into um, these T cells. And then they took these genetically modified T cells and re injected them um, into the little girl. They repeated this treatment for about two years. <clears throat> One of the caveats with this gene therapy treatment was that she was also getting ADA replacement therapy, like I said, so they were giving her both the protein and trying to cheat, uh, do gene therapy. Um, and these modified T cells actually persisted in her system for 10 years. And it seems as if um, she was able to overcome this um, immune deficiency. They don't really understand how, um, but this is her in uh, 2013. So 23 years later, she's 27, healthy. Um, this other woman, Cindy Kissick, <clears throat> she was 10 years old when she received treatment and she got her um, same kind of ex vivo T cell treatment um, about four months after Ashanti. So Ashanti was the first one. Um, this led the way to now, um, remember in class I mentioned um, umbilical cord cells you can store for your kids. So newborns that are diagnosed with the ADA deficiency um, they will use umbilical cord cells, uh, do this ex vivo treatment, and what I've read is it's one treatment and that lasts and seems to um, cure them. So that was pretty cool um, treatment. In 1999, there was a really unfortunate, what we'll call a low light of gene therapy. So this young man, um, Jesse Gelsinger, he has um, a mutation in the OTC gene. 
So it was, uh, this is ornithine trans carbamylase. <laughs> maybe this, for you, all you who've taken your organic and biochemistry, maybe that makes more sense to you. But um, it's normally an X linked gene disorder and um, fatal at birth. He actually had a mutation, so mutation um, after conception. So he produced some healthy protein or normal protein and some mutant protein. So Jesse was actually healthy um, by controlling his diet. and uh, some medications. So the reason this is so lethal is um, ornithine transcarbamylase, <laughs> I'm probably saying it wrong, um, when you, that, this enzyme is important for breaking down ammonia. Ammonia is a huge byproduct when you break down protein, right? So he has to have very low, or he had a very low protein diet, but you can imagine what do we feed newborns? Milk, high in protein, right? Um, so they actually do a newborn screening now um, for this um, disease because you can prevent um, some of the issues by diet. So anyways, Jesse was <coughs> a healthy young man. He turned 18 and signed up for a gene therapy trial for this disease as a healthy volunteer. So when I show you um, information about clinical trials, one of the first things they do is they try it on healthy people to make sure it's not toxic, um, trying to figure out, like I said, dosage and toxicity. Uh, so he went in and this was using an adenovirus vector. This was in vivo gene therapy. And they were looking at toxicity. Okay. Um, so he was part of the safety trial. He got this high level dose of adenovirus his immune system overreacted. He went into organ failure and within four days of the gene therapy treatment died. Now, there was some issues. Apparently, um, they didn't look at his um, ammonia levels and they were already high, which put him, I guess, at risk um, for any kind of treatment. Um, they had done some treatments with this level of adenovirus vector in non-human primates and the um, primates had adverse reactions and some other healthy patients with slightly lower doses had complained of adverse reactions. So it was a bad um, situation all the way around um, and this was a huge setback for gene therapy. Um, they stopped all gene therapy trials, um, told researchers, you know, Go back. You got to figure out how this stuff works before you keep trying on people. Another um, <coughs> disease that has been uh, looked at with gene therapy is another kind of skid. So this is an X-linked severe combined immunodeficiency, um, and this young man, um, David. Vetter lived from 1971 to 1983, and John Travolta kind of made this kid famous with a movie in 1976 called The Boy in the Plastic Bubble. So this young man had such a severe immune deficiency that he could not live outside. And if you can kind of look, this is a plastic bubble area that they um, built for him. So any kind of germ could kill him. Um, NASA actually made 
you can kind of see this space suit. So he was able to come out of um, this kind of enclosure that they had made for him. And this was like the first time that his mom actually got to um, sit with her son. Um, so it was pretty incredible um, what they did to help this boy survive. And um, at the time, the only therapy was a bone marrow transplant, and they could not find any exact matches for him. But they decided to um, use bone marrow from his sister um, because it was pretty close. So they thought they'd try. I mean, the kid didn't want to live in a plastic bubble forever. Um, unfortunately, four months after the treatment, uh, David died from lymphoma, which is a cancer, and it was due to um, him being infected with Epstein-Barr virus that was introduced to his, into his system during the bone marrow transplant. So he wasn't directly involved in gene therapy trials, but he kind of made this disease very famous, um, and they used his cells to try to figure out um, what they could do to help these children. So in 2003, they had uh, ex vivo um, gene therapy using bone marrow cells from the patient. So you don't have to wait for a transplant. Um, again, they used a retroviral vector to deliver the gene. Um, and in um, 2003, they had 20 patients get this therapy. <clears throat> Two and a half years later, and, and the, the therapy worked in the sense that these kids could now um, go outside, they could interact with people, so it was a success, except for four of the patients developed T-cell leukemia. And died. So when they looked back at the cells, oops, sorry, they found that this retrovirus had inserted the gene um, into a place that triggered cancer. Um, so again, uh, <laughs> a negative outcome of the gene therapy, though <clears throat> we need to remember that 16 of the patients survived and are now um, healthy and again can live without being confined to um, a plastic bubble. But it just goes to show that we don't have these vector systems under our control. Um, and so this it actually <clears throat> caused death um, due to a different disease in some of these patients. Another, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, disease that is um, fatal to newborns, um, well, I shouldn't say to newborns, children can live with this disease till they're about six or eight years old. Um, this disease was made famous by a 1992 movie called Lorenzo's Oil. And <clears throat> this disease is due to um, the ALD gene. This is also X-linked, really interesting. So if you remember your genetics, um, higher proportion of males are affected by these X-linked um, diseases. And the problem is with <clears throat> mutation in the a ALD gene, um, you can't degrade fatty acids, and so you lose um, your myelin sheath, protective coat for the nerves in the brain, um, it leads to mental disability and eventually to death. And <clears throat> 
for the longest time, the only therapy was to get a stem cell transplant. Of course, you had to re wait for a donor. So the gene therapy um, that's come about in 2017, again, ex vivo, um, you take bone marrow from the patient and you use a lentivirus vector to deliver the gene and the gene is actually called the ABCD1 gene. I don't know where it got that name. You also treat with chemotherapy to get rid of, I, I like how it says, helps make room for the new cells, but you're really trying to get rid of the cells with this defect so that the gene therapy cells repopulate. You put the fixed cells back and <clears throat> The results have been that 15 of 17 treated patients have had stable neurological function um, since the therapy in early 2017, so for almost um, two years. And if you look on the gene therapy uh, or the clinical trial site, you'll find that um, they're trying to do an intracerebral lentivirus injection. So they're recruiting 10 patients um, right now, and my understanding is that they're going to um, inject the lentivirus right into the brain to help uh, decrease this loss of mental function. Um, a key, again, this is now a disease that um, <clears throat> can be um, screened as a newborn because you have to diagnose it early. Um, or else once you lose mental function, you can't restore it. Um, another, uh, I would call this highlight, maybe, <laughs> um, is um, this company, Neurologic, <clears throat> had announced that they'd successfully completed phase one gene uh, therapy for Parkinson's. So what they were doing is using adeno-associated virus, injecting into the brain, and they were putting in the gene for a neurotransmitter called GABA. And what happens with a decrease in GAB GABA is that um, you start getting jerky motion and freezing and you can't control your movements. So by adding GABA back, they showed that compared to a placebo, they ha patients had increased motor control, decrease in jerking and freezing. Um, this wasn't a cure. Um, so <clears throat> it was really just minimizing um, symptoms um, unfortunately, the effectiveness decreases over the years, so it's not uh, permanent. Remember I told you that AAV can cause DNA integration, but doesn't always, depending on the vector. Um, and the efficacy of this treatment um, was too low for continued research. So... Um, this is not happening anymore, um, partly also because it didn't alleviate some other symptoms like some of the cognitive problems associated with Parkinson's. Um, it didn't <clears throat> um, decrease depression associated with Parkinson's, so FDA decided um, it's not good enough to continue research. Um, let's see what I have. Okay, I have two more examples. So, <coughs> cystic fibrosis. So, if you, um, oops, hitting the wrong button. Okay, whatever. Um, <clears throat> cystic fibrosis has been from the start looked at as a great therapy um, with great potential. Sorry for gene therapy, because you have this nice targeted cell tissue. Sorry 
and you have easy access. So a nebulizer, if um, you've ever had asthma or have seen someone with asthma and they take these inhalers, that's a nebulizer. So <clears throat> it's taking medicine, putting it into a mist form that can go into the lungs. So the latest that they've been looking at, um, they've tried lipid delivery. Okay, so I should back up. Cystic fibrosis is caused by a mutation in um, the CFTR gene, so um, a transporter gene. And <laughs> not only does it cause the la la lack of this um, transporter, causes mucus to build up in the lungs. It also causes issues with um, people with cystic fibrosis producing very um, salty sweat. So it's a, a ion transporter. Um, they can also have um, gastrointestinal problems. So <clears throat> the therapies that have been tried are only targeting the lungs. They're not um, fixing the problems with this um, um, transporter in other parts of the body. But the main problem with getting mucus and fluid buildup in your lungs is that bacteria and other microbes can accumulate. They can stick in there. It has a nice um, area. You have a hard time clearing it, and then you can get um, infections. Most of this work, I'm going to get back here in a second, is happening in the UK more than the United States um, because due to genetics, um, a higher percentage of people in the UK um, have cystic fibrosis carry this gene than other places in the world. <clears throat> okay, so they've tried lipid delivery. Um, the problem we talked a little bit about with lipid delivery is it's not long lasting. They're trying lentivirus delivery. They're trying AAV. Um, and they said that so far they've done um, large <clears throat> doses of AAV in an animal model and they haven't had a strong immune response. Um, what's really interesting is everybody thought cystic fibrosis was going to be an easy target because like I said you have this great location and you have direct access. It's a monogenic um, disease and it just has been harder than they thought um, to fix. <clears throat> One more type of um, gene therapy, which um, is manipulating at the genetic level, um, but it's a treatment for cancer, is called um, CAR-T therapy. So CAR stands for chimeric antigen receptor. So your T cells in your body <clears throat> are part of your adaptive immune response. So they have memory. And so your T cells will produce receptors that recognize specific recognize specific what we call antigens. So other specific proteins, um, or it can actually, they've been able to engineer these to recognize specific sugars. So <clears throat> one of the jobs of T cells is to destroy um, other cells, destroy other cells that express this antigen. So the idea here is we're going to genetically manipulate some T cells. This is ex vivo. <clears throat> um, you take out the T cells, you insert the gene for whatever receptor you want those T cells to make. You grow up millions in um, the Petri dish. <coughs> and then you put them back into the patient. And the idea is that these T cells will now, <clears throat> sorry, recognize cancer cells that are expressing this antigen, whatever you've designed the receptor to bind to. 
Um, and the cool thing is you could change this receptor to different antigens for different types um, of cancer. So the idea is now you're using your immune system to destroy cancer. Um, most of the work has been targeting blood cancers like leukemia, myeloma, lymphoma, because you can imagine you're putting this in IV and it can circulate through the body and try to destroy those blood cancers. Um, they are also trying to inject it into tumors. So there is um, so instead of getting a transfusion, you inject the CAR T cells directly into a tumor to try to get them to uh, destroy the cancer um, that way. And because these are your own cells, you shouldn't have an immune response. Um, and these are healthy cells that should be able to replicate. So looking at longer lasting um, therapy than just a chemotherapy type. Um, they did say that this requires chemotherapy to deplete um, some of the wild type cells so that you, I guess, have room, like they said in that other one, so that um, these new T cells can um, populate. So this is pretty, um, fairly new and pretty big thing for um, cancer uh, treatments. And again, it's considered a gene therapy because you are genetically manipulating the T cells. You're just really not manipulating anything in the, the human body. So those were some examples, a little walk through some of the highlights and lowlights of gene therapy. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk to you about, just so you kind of get a feel for this idea of clinical trials. So the goal of a clinical trial is to determine the safety and efficacy of a new drug or a new device or a new therapy. Okay, so after you've come out of the research lab and you want to try this on people, the first is phase one small number of participants and you're really looking at the safety of the treatment. So there are um, <coughs> companies around here in the Denver metro area that we recruit people for clinical trials. So my husband and I did a um, influenza vaccine trial when we first moved here, um, partly because they were going to pay us a couple hundred bucks. And like I said, I don't know if I told you guys or my virology class, um, as a graduate student, you get used to like selling your body parts for science to make a few hundred bucks here and there because you don't earn that much as a graduate student. So we were kind of still in that grad student mode. So we were like, sure, we'll try this um, flu vaccine and I don't know, whatever happened. Um, but this is where you start. So these are healthy volunteers. And you're really looking at the safety, so making sure it's not um, toxic. Then you go to phase two. This is studying the efficacy. Okay, so now you're looking at people with the disease. Again, small number. You see it can take up to a couple years. Um, and you're trying to say, is it working in a human? Is it doing what we think? Then you go to phase three and you can look, there's only 33% success rate. This is where a lot of clinical trials end. FDA, so Food and Drug Administration is involved in uh, regulating uh, clinical trials. And if they don't see, if you can't show that this is really doing something to benefit the patients, you're there going to stop you at phase two. Phase th three, <coughs> excuse me, is again, you're looking at safety always. Efficacy, is it better than other things out there? And adjusting dosing. So now you have a lot more participants. You're going to be able to um, include a more varied population. So males and females can react to different medications and therapies differently different age groups. Um, 
So this is really where uh, things come into play in phase three. And again, only about a 30% success rate. If you pass phase three, this is right before it becomes a drug on the market. So um, now you're looking at long-term <coughs> and cost effectiveness. Okay. You have a high success rate because you have passed all of these other hurdles. Um, so this is where most people are getting these um, drugs um, in the phase four studies. Um, and so when you look at your clinical trial that you're going to talk share with the class, see if you can tell which phase it's in. Probably um, still in early phases. So even if everything worked, look, you've got several months, a couple years, four years, so four, five, six, seven, eight years after, whoops, you've done all the animal models and drug development, um, the therapy development. Um, so it takes a long time to get a therapy or a drug um, to market. Um, I think we talked about in class one of the um, pieces of legislation that just passed. And now I'm going to forget. It's right to something. Um, <coughs> anyways, if you've exhausted all traditional treatments, they're allowing people to um, join these clinical trials. Or <coughs> I'm sorry, not join these clinical trials. <coughs> Excuse me. They're allowing therapies um, and medications that have not gone through these clinical trials to be used on people as kind of a last resort, last try to um, help them. So that's great because you can see this is a very long process to get to the public. Okay, I hope that uh, taught you a little bit more about some gene therapy um, actual trials, and I will see you on Wednesday.